Greetings and welcome to Joel Harrison and Anthony Pirog. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Richmond Sessions 2223. Richmond Sessions 2223 features a recording studio space within the exhibition Storied Strings, the Guitar in American Art, organized by us, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. The exhibition includes 123 works of art and 34 guitars divided into 17 themes ranging from politics, gen gender, and blindness to race and ethnicity. Linking these themes is the premise that the guitar as a visual motif has long enabled artists and their human subjects to tell stories that otherwise might go untold or undertold. This recording project, Richmond Sessions 22-23 in turn, is a showcase for contemporary musicians like yourselves to record songs and demonstrate the power of the guitar as a means for telling stories, invoking universal themes, and weighing in on myriad events. Joel, you are DC born, a graduate of Bard College. You've held a a Guggenheim Fellowship, and you've twice won the Jazz Composers Alliance Composition Competition. You've released 23, 20, 23. 23 yeah. albums. You've written scores for film. You've written scores of scores for film. Uh, you've written for orchestra, string quartet, solo cello and percussion, and even marimba. Yes. I have, I have learned. Mm -hmm. You founded and you direct the alternative. Good Guitar Summit, correct. which Pat Metheny uh, has called, quote, one of the most interesting and distinguished forms for guitar on the planet, end quote. On the planet, wow. So you're the editor and interview conductor of Guitar Talk Conversations with Visionary Players, and, and that's actually how I learned of you, and, and in addition to participating in the recording here in the studio, you were very, very helpful for me thinking about reaching out one performer in particular, but thinking about what this is. So um, in this book, you'll find, if, if you don't know this book, you should. Um, I should have brought mine down from my office to have you sign it. But included are interviews with fo folks such as Fred Frith, Nels Klein, Pat Metheny, Mary Halverson, All and right. many, many more. Um, and this recently came out, Modern Jazz Standards for Guitar. Can you tell us very quickly a little bit about this? Yeah, I thought that um, after years of sort of playing jazz standards with my colleagues from the same playbook uh, that folks have had for 30, 40, 50 years, that we might start playing each other's music. And so... I reached out to 30 or 40 guitarists who I knew and I said, how would you like to submit a couple of charts so that we can all put this in a book and have a document of our music and um, kids, students, as well as professionals might be interested in seeing what we're doing in a modern context. So it's a wide range of composers from fairly avant-garde to a quite straight ahead jazz Oriented tunes. Awesome. Modern Jazz Standards for gu Guitar by Joel Harrison. One of the interviewees in Guitar Talk is none other than the guy sitting right across from me here, Anthony Pirog. As a child, you, you've, uh, I read that you found your, your, your dad, a former surf band, surf band me members, Fender Jaguar, under a bed went to skip a few uh, in 2005. You actually, you went to Berkeley College of Music and, and, and NYU. Um, in 2005, you formed a cellist with Janelle Lapine, who is your, your wife. You That's released right. uh, a genre-bending album on Cuneiform to much acclaim in 2012. You've actually released a number of albums since then. You've toured the U.S. a lot. You've performed with... Um, Elliot Sharp, Mary Halverson, many, many folks. You've played with Joel in the band The Spellcasters, and you've also played in the trio uh, called The Mesthetics. 
Is that a portmanteau of aesthetics and messy? Yeah, the name came, um, Brendan Canty, the drummer in the Messetics, named the band, and it's a reference to a UK punk band, and yeah, it just kind of fit what we were doing. <laughs> right. A mix of jazz and punk hardcore stuff. Did Fugazi figure prominently in all of this, or...? Uh, yeah, the the other members of the Mesthetics were the rhythm section for Fugazi. So oh goodness, yeah. So you've played in a few trios, in fact, and you've yes. kind of jazzized or improvisized the idea of the power rock trio into you believe in the in the importance and power of the jazz trio. Oh, one hundred percent. I mean, there are all kinds of guitar trios um, that I was interested in. Obviously, you can reference early or classic rock, Cream, Jimi Hendrix, but then Fred Frith, as you mentioned, had Massacre, which was a big influence, and that was based more on free improvisation or Derek Bailey's tr trios. Um, and then the jazz trio as well. It's just um, the different contexts give the guitar a different kind of way to sound sure. and vocabulary. So it's very interesting to me to try to incorporate a little bit of all that. Very cool. Anthony Pirog's music has been lauded everywhere from Rolling Stone to the New York Times. Uh, the legendary improv guitarist and composer Henry Kaiser said of your album Pocket Poem, AAA++++, I like, I like that. Um, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> the best album of the year so far. He did everything right. Um, I am super impressed. In the in introduction to Guitar Talk, Joel writes that the guitar can howl, scrape, scratch, scream, soothe, and dream. And listening to a single, that single edit of uh, Danger Play, Pocket Poem, and Mori Point from the po Pocket Poem album, I'm tempted I'm, you know, to embrace Joel's contention for all the things the guitar can do. But in keeping with the theme of the exhibition, storied strings, can guitars narrate? Can guitars express? And if so, what does that mean, Joel? I think every instrument begins with a human voice that throughout the world and whatever culture you find, instruments are based upon the sound of the human voice to some degree so that the players that I like the most for guitar are the ones who more, most closely emulate the human voice. So I think one of the reasons I was attracted to electric guitar is because of the expansive way in which it could express itself. And that quote that you just made, um, that you quoted of mine, to me, tells me so much about why I love, especially electric guitar, because it, it really can sing like a violin and um, emote as if it's crying. It can express anger um, and has so often in our lifetimes. It can um, be a very humorous instrument. But also, it's the primary vehicle for actual lyrical storytelling in our culture. And so as guitarists, unlike pianists or violinists, we draw from an enormous trove of roots music that is purely American. Country, blues, it's all guitar music. And um, when I seek to cover a song for instance, on a record, I'm often thinking first about, well, what's a good guitar song, not just what's a good song, because entrenched in the history of the instrument is this lineage of great storytellers, Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, and then when you move to slightly more modern music, I definitely feel that people like Jim Hall or Derek Bailey are telling stories when sure. they play. Gotcha. Well, can you um, tell us about the story aspect of your first song that you're going to play? Well, the first song we're going to play is a song that I um, wrote called The Dawn of the Painter. And I don't necessarily think about stories 
um, when I'm composing, I think that instrumental music is expressive of emotions. So when I feel that the, based on that idea, the listener can kind of create a narrative from what I'm presenting and they can relate in more of a personal way as opposed sure. to someone telling you a story right. with words. So that's what I always, I don't really start with a story but a feeling and then when it comes time to name a song, it's hard to name instrumental sure. music. It'll make me think of a memory, a place, a certain time and that's where I will create my own kind yeah, of And I guess narrative. that's what I mean by a story, not so much once upon a time. Right. Well, I can tell you, in this case specifically, I was interested in a specific mode, and I was trying to compose a song with one note, uh, or wow. a melody with one note. Wow. I, there are, there's more than one note, but there's and a lot of one note. this is the dawn? Uh... This Adana the Painter. Okay, Adana the Painter.
Wow, thank you so very, very much. I have a couple of questions for you, but they're kind of preempted by what just happened at the very end with the strumming of chords and notes. That's, uh, I forgot to mention we were going to play a second piece. That's called Pocket Poem. Um, that's Pocket Poem. Yeah. So that's the title track from my latest cuneiform release. And um, it's all in the key of C. Um, I was influenced by a guitar piece that Morton Feldman composed. Right. And the diatonic aspects of some Arvo part. So we just decided to play as an outro. <laughs> I should have mentioned Was that. Dawn of the Painter, was that in the key of E? Yeah, E Phrygian. E Phrygian, okay. And this is a kind of in interesting chart because it's just a bunch of whole notes that he's cueing of indeterminate length with kind of dissonances that are based on the guitar, very much open string dissonances that, that ring nicely on this instrument. There's a real enigmatic space between those chords and, and notes. So a poem you can put in your pocket. It's not a very long piece. No. As a lot of poems are not terribly it, long. It was composed on a strip of paper that I tore off, and it was this big. Right. And I just put it in my pocket. That's where it came from. And the space that you um, are talking about in between the notes is what I'm, I was interested in. I performed this with quartets, and I wanted to have single attacks that were dissonant and have the listener have to deal with the decay <laughs> of the tone yeah. and the silence, and also me as the person that's cueing them. I have to deal with the pacing and the stress that <laughs> yeah, it's that very, creates. That space in between the kind of goes back to things like John Cage. The, exactly. The em emptiness there. And that, and that emptiness has, can, can have a sound all its, all its own. I, I was interested in, um, in terms of voicing the poem, your use of, Anthony, your use of harmonics in particular, and your expression pedal, is that what it's called? Volume pedal? Volume pedal, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that gives a vocal-like quality sometimes, I think. Right. It, it gives it almost a, a, a stringed, a, a violin or a... A key keyboard like uh, feeling, but what do those do for you? Well, the volume pedal is very useful because, as you know, with the guitar, there's limited range in the volume you can use in an attack. You can hit the string softly or you can hit it louder, but unlike a violin, you can't swell. Um, you can with the volume pedal. Right. What type of emotion, what type of, I'm sure there are a million different emotions and different um, expressions they, what were you trying to do with the volume pedal in, in, in that piece though? I find that a lot of times the sound I'm going for is something deep inside me that's, that's a, a mixture of a scream and a cry. Yeah. And it's not necessarily born from sadness, but more the human condition. Gotcha. <laughs> Which includes so many um, feelings. Understood. And I, I love that the electric guitar especially um, can um, speak to that. Right. What song would you like to play, play for us next? I think we're going to do one called Hudson Unlimited. Okay. And this is, um, this is a song that I, I wrote that's, that's relatively bright and sort of picturing riding the train up the Hudson River, which I've often done, especially as a young man. And uh, it has a little bit of the country influence, which is so important to both of us. As in the genre of country, or do you mean Americana? The Yeah, I, I guess, well, a little of both. I okay. mean, it, yeah, a little of okay. both. Thank you. 
the very the very end there could the softening the lowering of tone be compared to the view of a train or the landscape seen from a train receding into the distance or memory receding into mm -hmm. the distance sure <laughs> anything's possible i guess yeah <laughs> um well can you tell us a little bit about how what aspects of the train in, in its objective or subjective sens sensation um, that well, this ca captures? Sure. If, if you had a rhythm section with this, which there is in our record, you'd have the train beat. <laughs> with the snare drum. Sure. And so that's one thing. We emulate that a little bit with the strumming. Right. But there's also kind of a... a Oh, I don't know how to describe it. A, a very um, American feel to the beat and to the chord progression to me. And and I feel like I'm kind of referencing the Allman Brothers in parts. Absolutely. And so maybe not this train specifically, but that's sort of a bullion American traveling spirit yeah i notice in, in in comparison to anthony's song i mean for all the jazz chord voice voicings there are a number of you pl we're playing a number of rather straightforward bar chords in this this song mm -hmm. um so this is kind of mixing it up a little a little bit yeah can't can't stray too far from the good old bar chord well some of, us, some of us don't really know how, how to, but um, can you talk a little bit about which of your panoply of pedals you rely on most for, for this song and, and other tunes? Well, I'm, I'm using almost no effects, actually, at, at, you know, this is my basic pedal board, which is just a little reverb, a little delay, which kind of especially at a lower volume, kind of broadens the sound a little bit, gives me a little feeling of sustain. Sure. And uh, I have a reverb pedal that I, I kicked on for the last song for a little extra decay. And then I, I have this Analog Man Overdrive, which I'm barely using just for a little bit of bite um, when I'm soloing, a little bit of, of uh, distortion. Anthony, what pedals were you using in the last song? I'm essentially doing the same thing as Joel. I have some reverb and delay, which I view as like the pedal on a piano down so that I can fill in the space. So that's with the, of the ambience and without. It just makes, um, I like that to have some hanging over, sure. <laughs> some sounds hanging over in between things. And then like Joel, I have an overdrive pedal on just to have a little EQ and compression and the volume pedal. We're basically doing the exact same thing and we hit the exact same reverb pedal at the end. Did so, we? The afterneath, yeah. Oh, whoops. To get that. We didn't talk about it. It's just <laughs> we both knew that it needed that sound. So, but wonderful. I mean, when we do more extended technique stuff, a lot more pedals come into play. Yeah. Um, and a lot nuttier sounds but this is kind of your basic stuff sure so what song will you play for us now we're gonna play there's never enough time which we right. just recorded for an unreleased thus far record which will be coming out in 2023 and a piece that i wrote <laughs>
without being a master of the obvious here, can I ask what the song's about? <laughs> well, I was joking earlier that this is the type of song you only write when you get to a certain age. Okay. And I think it's a sentiment that becomes more apparent as we get older. Are there certain aspects of the song and of the playing of the composition that really connect you to that sentiment? You know, you don't really know where pieces are coming from when you're writing them. Sure. You have a certain feeling that you're chasing. You see the piece, it's right there, and, and maybe one chord tells you what the next chord is going to be, and then all of a sudden you're on this ride, and and you're you're just trying to kind of get out of the way and hear where it's going and follow that internal okay. uh, map, and then at the end of it you go, oh, I kind of see what this is about. So um, I don't know if you're always aware in the moment. It, sure. It's sometimes as apparent afterwards. So the idea of there not being enough time, there never being enough time, you didn't sit down with that, or did you have that sentiment, or more the, the composition effectively told you what it was about, in a sense? I think so, yeah. Um, when I play this piece, I feel that there's a kind of a deep mournfulness to it, but also sort of a light at the end with yeah. the final chord. And, um, you know, I, I try to title pieces in a, an appropriate and poetic way sometimes. Sure. That's important to me as sure. somebody who also uses words. And so... I do think often when I write a piece, the title can tell a story that the music then embodies. Gotcha. Well, well, well said. Can we get back to equipment for a while? Uh, that's a really nice uh, good guitar you have there. Uh, Anthony getting amazing oh, thank you. tones out of it. Can you tell us a little bit about this Abernethy yes, instrument? Yes. Um this is um, made by a single builder in um, Guadalupe, California, which I, like I said earlier, is uh, near Pismo Beach on the coast. Mm -hmm. And um, I was playing in Santa Barbara with the Mesthetics, and Justin came and presented this guitar to me, and I fell in love with it, and I've been playing it nonstop. Um, I mean, instruments are a whole other thing. Finding the instrument that you connect with, that's... Um, it happens, but not all the time. You can convince yourself that anything's good, but this has been a really nice guitar for me. It, it has a nice full range right. um, from what I hear, so it's got a nice top end that isn't too bitey, and you can get fatter kind of jazz sounds. There are some... Um, you're in good company playing that. I saw online Jeff Tweedy and a number of others. He plays playing. one, that's for sure. Yeah, he, he not only plays one, he plays the same model. It appears... Very similar to what year? Yeah, this is their offset model. So the offsets I mean that the contours are an angle, a strat and telly body is straight across. And I was playing jazz masters and Mustangs and Jaguars, like you mentioned. That's the first guitar I played because my dad was in a surf band. Between that and grunge being on television when I was eleven, yeah. I was drawn to these kind of offset guitars. Gotcha. Sure. Tell us about the Paul Paul Reed Smith you're you're playing. Well, I played vintage guitars my whole life, um, Gibsons mostly, and sometimes a telly, which I still have them, and I play them a lot, but I, I walked into Rudy's Music one day many years ago, and somebody was playing this. I had absolutely knew nothing about Paul Reed Smith guitars, and I said, wow, that sounds incredible. And I ended up buying the guitar, and... Um, I think that what attracts me to this instrument is its versatility. It's incredibly easy to play. It's, it's set up in such a genius. It, it, it's so perfectly crafted that it, it invites 
hands, even with oncoming issues with arthritis, to play it. It just is, is light and set up beautifully. So I, I don't play this all the time, but often when I'm traveling, it's just the most versatile thing to bring along. A lot of my guitars that I used to play, for instance, like a Gibson ES-345, they're really heavy, big-bodied guitars, and uh, ergonomically a disaster. Yeah. The Les Paul. Oh, I mean, I'll play it in a, the studio. Such a great but, full sound, but yeah, try standing up with that at a gig for two hours. Mm-hmm. Even a weight-relieved Les Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So will you play us another song? Yeah. Yes. This is called The New Electric. Great, great, Um, great, great. It's from my... It's okay. Recording from 2014, Palo, Colorado Dream. But we're going to start with um, Danger Play. It's a little intro.
I don't know about the other guys in this room right now recording you, but I don't know if you all sometimes feel, what did I just listen to? That was, that was really, really great. I love the dissolution of theme and then re return to the non-gain or non-distortion -dis anyway. Anthony, what is this song about? I think that um, at the time I wrote this probably like 12 years ago. It was about having hope. Um, this was a reaction to something that I had heard and I was feeling very down and I knew it was out of my control. But um, so I just sat down with my baritone guitar. I usually play this on a baritone, which is tuned down a fifth to A. And um, this just came out and I, there's not much more I can tell you. Sure. Um, have I seen you online playing a Dan, Dan Electro on this song? That's what I have, yeah. I brought uh, yeah. the baritone to play. It's a Jerry Jones, which is the same design. Yeah. But okay. okay. We, uh, we're not using it. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so without pushing this too far, can you tell me, just traveling back in time a little bit, what are some of the ways in which the song might evoke hope? I mean, just by the end, I give myself the opportunity to really cut loose. Um, yeah. So on the record, it's very slow, it's very soft. Um, and, you know, for a couple of reasons, I want to take solos, because I play the guitar as an instrumentalist. Sure. I like fuzz. I, knew I wanted to lift the energy and the feeling um, with dynamics, density, <laughs> range. Um, so at the end, also, I mean, I've seen people that I admire do the exact same thing for 60 years. So, I mean, I'm just also trying to capture that feeling that I get as a listener and hopefully convey that to other listeners. Um, yeah, well, it, it, it certainly works. But I mean, it's the exact opposite of ending like the first piece we did with the long tones where I'm trying to build anxiety. <laughs> right. You know, we, I want to yeah, build you excitement go from in the a, room. Almost metal kind of hard rock feeling to uh, is sweet, I almost want to say, at the very, at the very end. I mean, that works. Yeah. Joel, in guitar talk, you say the guitar is a town square. Hmm. Where, do you ever get tired of people quoting you as, as, if, as if you don't know what you wrote? You <laughs> no, I don't. But believe me, it doesn't happen that often. Okay. Would you do it again, in fact? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> You say the gu guitar is a town square where folks of all sorts can meet up and share news. Can you tell us about what you're getting at there? Mm -hmm. When you grow up as a guitar player, you see the myriad ways that it functions in society. And I think that's one of the things that attracts people to the guitar is you can carry a guitar with you and you can play it anywhere. And you can play chords not just single notes, and people can sing along. So uh, if you're a guitar player and you're sitting around and there's a bunch of people, you're often asked to be the songsmith um, so people can, can sing. And I find that the guitar is very inviting as an instrument for that reason, that it's not um, a single note instrument. It's... Uh, it can be played, any kind of music can be played on it, from the simplest to the most complex. And often it truly has shown itself to be an instrument that brings people together, whether it's 60,000 people watching Paul McCartney in a football stadium or a, a small campfire in the middle of the woods. Can you tell me just a little bit more about the music you all have been recording of late? Do you have an album of as such project you're working on? Yeah, that's really exciting um, because we've known each other now for a number of years and um, have similar affinities. And so we finally wrote music together. Each of us wrote the pieces and um, we, we have an incredible rhythm section, Allison Miller on drums and Stefan Crump on bass. And, we recorded uh, a few months ago, really wide-ranging 
um, record that we're going to release on, on my small record label, AGS Recordings, in 2023. Very guitar-based record, obviously. It does many of the things that, um, that the guitar is capable of, but um, certainly not all. <laughs> Can you all play one more song to take, take us out? Um, yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> well, thank you all so very much for joining us here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts on Richmond Sessions 22-23. It's been really a delight. I've learned so much. And, and I know others watching this will as well. So thank you so much for joining us and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank for you, Leo. Us. Thanks for putting this together. It's oh, a great idea and exhibit. And oh, thank to you. invite all these guitar players here to do what they do is a gift to the guitar community. Well, it's uh, a la labor of love for, for me and um, really glad to have you all here in our friends from in in your ear studios making this all happen too so thank thanks again <laughs>